Hi, I'm Esben and welcome to this short video lecture on doing map design. There are two meanings to the word design that we use here. Design is meaning layout, i.e. how we arrange the graphical elements on output media. And design meaning development to meet a specific purpose. Any map has a purpose and in order to meet that purpose we design or develop our map in a specific way so remember when we talk about design it's not only the graphics it's also about which elements we are going to use and how we're we going to use them when we talk about purposes of the map um, for a specific purpose. It's important to define the purpose. In general we can talk about four different purposes of maps. We can use maps to explore the unknown. Is there something useful in this data? So we have some data and we say okay can we extract some information from that? We can use maps to analyze data. So what does this data tell me about my problem, if anything? We can use maps to synthesize knowledge, that is to bring different elements together so that we can compare them and see, hmm, is there some uh, relationship between cholera and polluted water? And finally, we can use maps to present information, support a claim, um, this is how it is, or perhaps to start a discussion. I, uh, is this what, uh, how it could be, or what should we do about this? So, maps have different purposes, and um, you have to be clear on what purpose are you trying to achieve when you are constructing your map? It's not always that map is the answer to any question. Sometimes maps are a good tool to use, other times we should perhaps do something else. I'll try to list some uh, arguments for and against using a map. The obvious one is that everything happens somewhere and maps are very good at showing where. Maps are often the only way of visualizing spatial patterns in statistical tables. It can be really difficult to see patterns, spatial patterns in tabular data. Maps are often good for investigating unknown relations because if there is a relation between different factors they will probably be occurring if not exactly at the same location then at related locations. So the fact that things fall together spatially are similar probably indicates that there is some form of, of relationship between them. Maps, like other graphical visualizations, use, you might say universal, but at least semi-universal language that is understood by a large audience. If this, uh, so we can reach many people with the same product. And finally, maps are often engaging. There's a, ah, look, hmm. Didn't I go to a holiday there? Or don't I know someone who lives there? Or I've heard of that place before. So there's lots of things that can engage the reader from the map. And that is basically the start of making people work with information. That is engaging them. There's also reasons why not to use a map. Basically when you do any visualizations, the X and Y 
X as either the most important, most dominant aspects of communication, where things are located on the X and Y axis. It means much more than how large the dot is or the color or something like it. And that X and Y axis has been occupied by the physical space. So if you can't use it for anything else than location. Maps has also a disadvantage that it's difficult to keep location secret on a map. A dot is a dot and oh that's where that dot is. So if it's some protected plant or something like that, hmm, maps might not necessarily be the perfect solution. There was a situation where the spatial patterns are so silly and simple that you really don't need them to make a map of them. And people live in big, in the major cities. Yeah, okay. We don't have to make a map to tell you that. Um, and finally, your map making skills or the time resources or money resources you have available just is not enough to make that map that can be useful in the situation. Sometimes you just say, okay, yeah, it would be nice to make a map here, but we ain't got the time and we ain't got the money. So, there are situations where maps are not the right tool, or the real tool to use. So, well, there are other things we have to consider. If we decide to go for a map, we have to consider which context is this map going to be used in? Is it going to be a page in a document, a project work, um, an appendix in some general publication, used in a slide presentation? Is it going to be a standalone product, a big poster hanging somewhere where, we, where it has to tell a story by itself? Depending on these contexts, the map has to be able to tell more or less its own story. If it's in a big document, well, there will be pages surrounding it telling what the map is about. If it's alone, as a poster, it has to do all the explanation by itself. The media that the map is going to be displayed on also has importance. Is it a map for a PC screen, a projector, a mobile device, print or web? Each of these different medias have different demands on colors and detail and some of them are even interactive so people can start zooming and roaming around in the map so the media will play a crucial role to how you decide on your map and finally you should always consider your audience what is their cultural background educational do they have specific knowledges that they might lack or that they can use in understanding the map. So think about who is this map for? Can they read it? A uh, common situation is that when we're doing maps we can use things like uh, semi-variants or use things like uh, standard deviations. Well, most scientists know what this is. But quite a lot of normal people do not. And if your map says, okay, this is the mean plus minus one standard deviation, well, you might lose quite a lot of your audience if it is for a broader audience. So think about it, what they know, what they don't know. When we start talking about how we're going to design the graphics of a map, we have two key elements to talk about. We have the data frame, that's where we have visualized our data. And then we have the marginalia, that's all the things that are around it. That's called, why it's called marginalia, because it is in the margins. Things like scale bars and legends and things like that. They're all part of the marginalia. They are part of the final map, they are crucial to the design of the map but they are not part of this data frame so you have to think about them how you can use them um, 
there might also be things that you have to have on it, such as copyright or information about the source of the, the data, things like that, that might be good to have or things that you just have to have. A quick look at a classic example from my study book. This is a traditional topographical map. I'll just use it to talk about what elements are on a map and then have, so we have the names for them. First of all, we'll have a title. It's usually um, something that draws attention. It should have a dominant size. It should serve as a focus. So we say, okay, here, this is where we start. It will give the reader the first idea of what the map is about. We'll have a legend explaining what symbols we have on our map. It should be said that if you do eye movement analysis of people reading maps, most people never look at the legend. So it's important that the symbols you use can stand for themselves. Legends are only something you need for the nerds who say, oh, what is this exactly? Or for the, if you have a complex situation where you can't make self-explanatory symbols. So remember, you probably need a legend, but it's probably not an important part of the map because most people don't look at it, or if they do, they first do it, look at it after they have tried to understand the map without them. Scale bar. On a topographical map like this, yeah, scale bars are important, and um, and scale bars must be there. Um, scale can be given in different fashions that you should be aware of. Um, we have first we have the scale given as the ratio. 1 to, in this case, 1.5 million. So that is the scale of the map. So 1 centimeter is 1.5 million centimeters in reality. So that's one way of doing it. There's also a scale bar that you can use. In general, the scale as a numerical value is useful for experts. We know what to expect when we see a specific map scale, but it's not normally the starting point for a new map reader. For new map readers, scale bars are much more efficient, so they much easier can relate to them. Also, they are, of course, easier if you're going to do measurements on your map than they are the thing to use. Note also that if your map is going to be on the web or on a screen or on a projector, you can't be sure that this scale will hold true. It depends on how the physical hardware is configured. And once you've made your map and made a image or a PDF document from it, this is locked into the text and can't be changed. So if the map scale changed due to projections or rescaling of any kind, then this will be wrong. Scale bars, on the other hand, they stay true because they are scaled up and scaled down together with the map. So they are useful in media where you've not got the full control of the print situation. While the scale bar is a bit more dangerous, but for professional market users, that's a very important element. If you look at these scale bars, there's one both in miles and kilometers. We normally don't use miles on Danish maps, we only use the kilometers map. But note that zero is not at the bottom. The classical map for doing measurement has zero, one unit up, and then that unit underneath zero has more subdivisions than the ones above zero. That's because then you can measure, let's say, a distance, and then that distance can be said, okay, that might just be a bit more than 20. Your measure. And then if you want to know how much more than 20, you move your measurement down to the 20 and then see how far down into that subdivision it comes. 
and that way you can without having to clutter your scale bar with a lot of subdivisions all the way up you can still make a precise measurement so this is the classical way for a map meant for measurements if it's a map meant for tourists you might write things like one centimeter equals four kilometers or things like that so they would probably find that more useful than having a scale bar on their map A map itself doesn't necessarily have to consist of only one data frame. In this case, there is two data frames, one with a detail map and one with a overview or location map here. So this here says where in a larger context is the detail map. We could also have an insert map as we call them in general that had it zoomed in. So you had um, distribution of income across Copenhagen, oh sorry, across Denmark, and then because there are so many variations within a town like Copenhagen, you had an insert map showing a zoomed part of Copenhagen. So, insert maps can both be used for overviews and for detailed zoomed in views. Then there's things like, oh, those things you have to write credits, co uh, copyright. Note, by the way, that maps, you know, when you re reference a map, or oh, sorry, give the, the information of the source, it's a copyright. Maps are not just like text that you can say, I'm quoting Holmes 2015. No, the person that has made the map or matter of fact, the person that has generated data behind the map has a copyright on it. So even though we are allowed to use maps from the Danish cadaster, we will still have to print a copyright to the Danish cadaster, or as is now known, Geodata Stuelsen, on our maps. So just because you have given the lines colors, that doesn't give you the copyright of the map. It gives you the copyright of the design, but not the map. So you need to reference the source with a copyright information and not just saying where you got it from. Dates, typically of the date that the map was produced or maybe as the date of when the data was collected. Many Danish maps have three dates on it. The printing date, the date it when it was last updated and the date of the original measurements. Um, of course, other types of data don't need to be so detailed in the dating. And finally, I've said a logo. Well, it's not so much a question of a logo. Typically, a student project does not have a logo. But it's a question about what is called a graphical identity. Um, Ensuring a graphical identity on your maps is very important. You will find that the first map people read of yours, they will scrutinize it in much detail. If they then trust the map and say, okay, it looks right, I believe this, then they won't scrutinize the next maps as much if they can recognize it as being like the first. So it's a question about ensuring that your graphical design transfers trust from the first map to later maps. It's not because the reader shouldn't scrutinize it, doesn't matter, but it is annoying for the reader to have to scrutinize it. So it's much quicker if they say, okay, I trust the basics, I can just see what is this map telling me. And the way that they come to that situation is if you have this transfer of trust from a map they have already seen. So when we do this type of design, we really also pinching trust from our maps. You will see that many maps look alike. They try to look like official maps because there's a trust in the official map and then you can take some of that trust over on your own map. So within a project, ensure that all your maps look alike having the same graphical layout, having recognizable symbols. 
In that way, the reader, once they have accepted one of your maps, they will also accept your next maps. So, that's a talk about the map. There's some things you should consider. I mentioned that there's quite a lot of research on doing eye movement of people looking at maps. And, not surprisingly, people, at least in the Western Hemisphere, start up in the top left corner. They move across, their main focus will be somewhere in the centre of the map and then they'll move down to the bottom right corner of the map. What's in the bottom left and top right corner is seldom seen. So that's where you put information that you have to put there but it's not really important for you to have there such as copyright and dates and things like that. It's, they are not central to the story that you're trying to tell with your map. So you put them in those two corners at the top right and the bottom left because no one looks there. The important things, function, things you want people to read first should be somewhere on the line starting up at the top left and ending in the right bottom. And in this case I would probably, if I made this map, not put this company logo at the top left. At least not if I was not trying to sell the logo at least. I would probably put a title or something in that corner because it is more important you see that corner before you see the centre. So think about it, that line of reading and that you should have important things on the line of reading and less important things are far away from that point of line of reading. There's lots of different design rules when you talk about how to design a map. Um, and much of this comes because a map is what we call a synoptic object. Synoptic, syn means at the same, optic c, so something that you see at the same time, meaning that you don't start like a text and then read down through it. You see, you can jump around your eyes, even though they have this line of viewing, we don't know that the reader will follow it. Or once the reader has followed it, they might start wandering around on the map to find things that are interesting. So there is no explicit order. We can't say chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3 in reading a map. We have to graphically encourage the reader to read the map in the right order. And this is where all of these different graphical design rules come in. The first rule is called KISS, keep it simple stupid. It's basically about that the design of the map is not about how much information you put into the map, it's how much information the reader gets out of it. So don't put anything onto your map you don't need there. Or at least don't put it if it doesn't have a graphical function. You might put things that are not necessarily for the story of the map, but you just put them in because there's an empty space. Danish maps typically have this very big empty space over in Sweden, where north of the island of Bonhoeffer. Mm, what should we do about it? We could put Sweden in there, of course. We could put Sweden in a grey colour and put things on top of Sweden. So, think about trying to reduce the amount of information you put into your map. That's KISS. Another of these design principles is CRAP. That's what your map shouldn't be. And CRAP is about some of the tools that you can use to avoid making CRAP maps. You can focus on contrast. We'll talk about that. You'll focus about repetition. There's a lot of, it's generally underestimated that if you have a time series that you can repeat the same map. We call them um, pebble maps. A series of small maps next to each other are showing different time periods or showing different properties over the same area. You don't, they don't have to be very detailed because what people are looking at is changes in pattern and if that pattern can be seen well that's fine and there the repetition is important 
alignment. There is a general design rule for any graphical design that if there is a difference, make a difference. It means that there's nothing worse than things that are almost aligned. If things are almost aligned, they say they're absolutely aligned. If they're not aligned, make sure that it's clearly that they're not aligned. So that's it. People don't think it's a mistake that they're not aligned. And then proximity. Put things that belong together, graphically together. Um, we can't typically move so much around the map, but we can, some of those marginalia, think about the role, role of proximity. Personally, I normally follow what I have decided to call Couch B. I have reordered the lettering um, of these important things from a general text about map design and found out that all of those have not good names like Kiss and Crap and the best I could get come up with was Couch B. And I'll, in the following I'll talk through each of these elements of the couch clarity order, unity, contrast, harmony and balance and how we can implement these in QGIS. Clarity is basically the same as KISS. You want your map to be clear, you want the information to stand out. So you try to avoid to put things in that shouldn't be there. You try to ensure that symbols and colors are clear and easy to distinguish. You probably noticed when you're watching these videos that I sometimes am trying to focus my eyes because I am not haven't got the best eyesight in the world. And there are many people like me that need clear symbols and clear colors to read the map. So think about ensuring that the map is readable. Try increasing the distance of the map to the double of the distance that you expect to look at it and see is it still readable. If it is then you probably got your clarity right. And then try and focus the user's attention on what's interesting. Where is the interesting part? Try and remove the less important things. Of course we might need to have some context there but try and focus on what's important. The regions that are important. They are some of the tricks you can use to ensure clarity. In QGIS, if you're going to Im implement clarity, there are different ways of doing it. There is um, on our layer properties, there, there is a, a tab general and there, there is ability to create a feature subset. I'll just try and demonstrate quickly in QGIS. So I'll switch to QGIS and for this purpose as I said I will, I will I'm go, what I'm going to try to achieve today is I'm not going to create my new fancy data. What I really want to do is I want to take the historical map of Frederiksberg and then say okay this is the, how Frederiksberg looked in 1890. So I'm not going to fiddle too much about colors and things like that. I'm going to fiddle on the design. How do we do that? And um, I want to start out by focusing on the municipality of Frederiksberg. In order to do that I'll then load a data set sorry, um, of municipalities and I'll use my browser window and I found it here, this one, down in my local data file. So I'll use this one. Okay. And I'll now demonstrate some of this thing, this, how we can remove some of unneeded data. We'll be talking much more about using SQL, query language, later. But to now, let's start with the properties and go into our general tab. And we have this one that is provide a feature filter. So we're going to filter our data set. And there's a query builder. And we can go in and say, okay, I'm only interested in areas on Sealand. And there is a region name attribute here. So I can say region name equal, and I can then get a list of the region names if I can't remember how they're spelled. So I say 
and I want to have sealant all my or air should also contain region name equal hosted like that I can test it and it said that was fine and I can say okay what you'll note now is that all the parts of them are, that are not in these two regions will disappear. So, so now we have concentrated on this area. Um, but as I mentioned, we will, uh, we will focus more on that um, later, how we uh, use SQL. And as a matter of fact, I'm going to focus right in on the Copenhagen area. The next thing I could do is that I wanted to focus on flag spare. So I want to make sure that this area is the important part. But this is not the data I'm going to show. I'm just going to use it to mask away what I don't want. So people look here in this area. What I can do there is I can go in again and look at my properties and this filter here and say okay these are the areas that I wanted and I'll just because when you start using more advanced SQL brackets are important so I'll say these brackets so they have to be ones and the municipality name has to be not equal to, and I get all of them, flag spare. Okay. So what I'm now saying is that I want my area to be part of Region Zealand or Copenhagen, but not flag spare. And what happens now is I have a nice hole here. Flag spare has been removed from my data set. So if I now add from my VMS, so I'll find my VMS, we could choose it here, or we could go up to layers and say add layer, oops, add layer, a VMS. We could connect to our VMS server. I can go down into topography and I will go down and find that map here so late 1800s beginning 1900 and I will say add and close it so it's now connecting to my server and hopefully it doesn't take too long time for it to generate so okay so now I've got this on top of that one what I wanted is I wanted to bring that underneath so now you can see I have masked out everything that's not part of flag spare. So, of course this is now a silly color for this purpose so I'll uh, start by changing the style of it so I'll make it uh, a white color um, and I might also say that I don't want any borderline around them. So now I've got a relatively clear masking that says okay this is flag spare. That's one way of reducing our data sets. Um, there's also a special plugin that can do this a wee bit smarter. Um, than what I've just done and with a better effect. So you need to install the plugin called Mask. Um, this is probably the first plugin you're going to install. So you're going to plugin and then plugins and choose this manager plugin. Here we will get a list of all our available plugins. QGIS and 
we can see which ones are installed. I have already mask installed, but never mind. And I can fast now search for. You see, here we have mask. And I then choose if I hadn't installed it, it would say install. So your computer's in here will say install and you and then ready to run it. Once it's installed, it will locate itself somewhere up here. Most of them install themselves underneath the plugin menu. So here we have the mask plugin. So the way that it works is that if I go back here and remove our filter, duh. so and okay, so now I have all of them. I start out by selecting the object I want to mask out. So this one, I click the flex back. Now that's the one I'm going to use for my mask. And I go up in the plugin and say mask. And it will then ask me how do I want to, to create it. Um, I just leave it with the default values. And then we can change them afterwards. So okay, it will run. And it's now creating this mask layer and loading the background image. So once it's finished processing, we have our mask layer and we have the layer that we used to generate the mask and we have our underlying uh, topographical map. If I now deactivate our start layer, you can see that we now have a nice semi-transparent white background over everything apart from our detailed area that we have flex background spells and it has created this little blue boundary around it. And even though I will zoom out, if I zoomed out, it will not change, it has masked everything that was within my municipality layer. So the mask is as large as this one, but with one little hole that covering the area of the and I didn't have to do, use any SQL or something like it. It mask also has different other properties and I can go in and change. And the style, it has the transparency so I can make them a bit more transparent. Or it uses a shape burst as its fill. And if I wanted another type of color than blue, I think blue is appropriate for the type of map, but if I wanted another one, I could choose another color for it. So what I, now I've done is I've just made it a wee bit less transparent, or more transparent, sorry. So now we can see a bit more of the area outside for expert. So that's the use of the mask tool. Um, and it's, um, Normally this works fine with uh, the default, you don't have to go in and change coordinate systems and set these, but if it does strange things, make sure that your data is in a projected coordinate that is probably where it normally goes wrong. Order is this question about our oh, map being a synoptic object. So we have to try and ensure that the map reader reads it in the order we want it. We might say we're going to create a, a graphical chain of breadcrumbs for the map reader to follow. This um, chain of breadcrumbs will probably start with something big and heavy graphic, heavy colors, red or black or some dense colors, um, such as a title or perhaps a logo and then lead on through the other elements. Uh, maps doesn't have to have a chain. You know, they, they, we can leave them up to be truly synoptic. Um, maps that people see many versions of topographical maps, they are typically created without no graphical order in them. Apart from that, there might be a neat line 
a thick border around the data frame in which the data is to tell the reader that okay the map is inside this what's outside that's all those marginalia things look at them afterwards look at what's inside the box first but that's some cases um, so we will start out by putting in um, a, um, a top a, a legend and we will probably put it in in the top left corner. If you remember from the previous video on, on getting started with QGIS, we create a layout by going into this map composer, giving it a name, play expert, and then this is then our output paper. Um, It is a, a four paper we can see over here, um, and we could change it to a different data format if we want to, to print it out in A3 or something like it. We can change that there. We'll leave it as an A4. Then we start by inserting the map frame. That's this tool here, and we will insert a map frame something like this. Um, I think that flying spare is a bit not in the center so I'll just use this too and then move it a bit up so that it's a bit more centered inside that data frame. Now I want a big heavy graphic element so I'll choose my text and click where I want it over here somewhere and I'll write flying spare. Let's say 1885. It's somewhere around 86. It's somewhere around there. Um, which font should I use? Well, I want something big and beefy. Uh, and I would probably want it in a bold also. Okay, that was perhaps beefy enough. So we'll uh, change down our font to 28. So that was a bit more like it. Um, so that's probably where the reader will start. If you now want to continue the breadcrumb, I will might put a logo over here or something like that. Um, I can go into my graphics and I can place a, uh, a symbol here and I'll just use my uh, graphical element and I'll send in a north arrow I'll go for some one of those bit more classical ones like this one so what I'm doing now is that I'm leading the map read along here and they'll be following the line of the text to this one and then I can lead them down that so I'm creating a chain this way around. Probably shouldn't have used the North Arrow, but hey. And um, then I can lead them down to a new element. So I could... Uh, and uh, I can... Uh, Create a longer text. I should have some text about flags, but I haven't got this, so it will be a blah 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 text. And something like that. So now I have hopefully ensured that the map reader will read this text at some point. Things that I then don't need to be part of uh, my chain, such as my scale bar, I will uh, dump it down here. Um, doesn't look very neat like this. Um, I think I will change it to uh, what does it say? Kilometers to
So RB could, uh, let's say there's 1000 of these meters to one kilometer. So let's see how this would work. So it looks fine. Um, oh, acceptable. We could um, work, insert the another scale underneath it, and then say so that's going to be a numerical scale. So this map is at the moment in a scale of one two. 52,270. That's not a really nice scale. So I will um, change the scale by using my item selector. Select this one. See, it's got the scale up here. And say it's going to be 1 to 50,000. Like that. And hopefully it will. Uh, update it now to be at the scale of 1 to 50,000 and it says down here that that's the scale and we can then move these a bit around so it looks a bit more neat underneath each other or something like that good um, if um, we are having a legend won't we insert a legend here we will probably put the legend over in this area here because we have created this reading line all the way across there So that's um, something about implementing order. Unity is a question about that you don't want your map to tell contrasting stories. You want the map to tell one story and the same story. So when you think about your graphical elements, your design, all the things you do, um, lettering, um, you should think in a theme, say okay what type of map am I producing am I trying to produce a historical looking map or a modern map am I trying to give my map some scientific error or should I try and make it look a bit casual and, and this is a map you can do something about and you might say well what does that how can we implement these things um, in our map, well, basically there's something about some of the things we can change are the symbols, which type of symbols are we using, I'm not using very many symbols in this one, and not any at all, but we can choose from our symbol library, we'll talk about that later in the course, some symbols that are within my story and my North Arrow, you saw different choices of North Arrow, I could have chosen a more contemporary looking North Arrow, but that would be against my, um, my, my line of story. The font, there's basically two types of fonts you might know of. There's what's called serif fonts and sans serif. Sans serif of course means no serifs. The serifs is those small things that are at the end of the letters. This one up here is a sans serif. There's no serifs on this text. So it has a modern look to it. If I try, I can go back in a moment and oh look now, I got this one again here is a modern text, and maybe that was not the most appropriate for this purpose. If I go into my fonts and say, okay, I don't want a sans serif, I'd choose the serif version of it, and you can see I get a much more old-fashioned looking font. So. Just choosing serifs or non-serifs, of course, is a very simple trick, but a trick you should consider in this implementing your Unity. There's also, of course, uh, many different fonts that you can choose from in order to create a, a look and feel of your what you want. And then there is the layout. Um, I'm using here a rather classical layout, um, straight line, straight flow around um, which is in in relationship to this classical map story that I'm telling if I had started to do things like uh, let this uh, 
North Arrow half overlap the map. Well, I'm breaking that story. I'm then being moving into the realm of modern map design. So in this case, I won't do that. But of course, I could have chosen to do that in order to change the feel or the unity of my map. Contrast. Contrast is a thing about ensuring what is at the top and what is at the bottom. Generally, humans see white as a bottom layer and the more dense the color is, the higher up it is. So we might first see the goblet in this case and then afterwards see the two faces because they are the background, they are the white element. So when we're doing this type of map design, in this case I'm doing a very simple one, we ensure that we shouldn't put too much darkness. If I made this a dark mask around it, so it was darker than in the air inside, then that will start to look as the front. And well, I for expert, which is my key area here, would look as a background. So I'm ensuring that the surroundings look lighter than my key area. And also I'm using this dark edge that is emphasizing place back. And does that by my neatly making it the contrast to the surroundings less. So it has a dark edge on the inside towards the area that we're trying to create focus on and the fuzzy edge on the outside away from the focus area so if we won't get so much focus on this but we'll get focus on the line where the contrast between the dark blue and the area of no mask is highest so we'll work with contrast in different ways we think of it as our color space we ensure that we have light colors and we don't it's very important you'll often see that the first maps people make they put use two dense colors very quickly and they run out of color space. So you have to be economic with your color space. That's why sea and land are douche colors. So a light baby blue and a, just a wee off white color for landmass. That's because we are trying to conserve color space. So we've got more color space to put layers on top. So don't start with making landmass dense green, seas, dark blue, because then you have used up most of your color space. Um, we showed here the use of our uh, mask as a way of doing it. That in general, the same tool that is implemented in the mask can be also used, um, at, namely this that's called shape burst. Shape burst if we go back to this map here and I'll deactivate my mask and my for a moment and zoom to the layer of all our municipalities there this this very douche yellow color here if I wanted to give them colors according to the municipality code I could do that in my style I could choose uh, categories, I could choose to use uh, go my money name, like that, say classify, and say apply. Okay. This test out of the box is hitters. So, two dense colors. There might be a series of colors that were less dense than this that I could use. Um, let's see if this one will be a bit more. So that was a wee bit better. Uh, but you know this might be too much in the other direction. Um, I don't know how this one will be. So I'll use this one. It's not good but we'll use it. Um, Go back that one. Oops, sorry. 
um, different default colors. There are no of them that are really good. Uh, but what we can do to reduce the amount of color available and therefore leave room for have motor roads and other things on top of these municipalities is to use this sunburst tool, shape burst tool. Um, so I go to properties and at the moment we are using a f simple color. If I change my fill from a simple color to this shape burst Um, and something like that. And you, what you can see now is that it has make sure that we have dense colors on our boundaries and less dense in the center. So we are reducing the amount of color used in our map. I'm not saying this is a nice coloring, um, but it has solved the problem of having used too much color space because I get quite a lot of areas inside the centers of the municipalities where I don't have so much color. And how much I got there, I can control that in my, uh, my, um, my tool, uh, my shape burst tool. So uh, I have my shape burst tool. And I can then choose um, how quickly it should um, reduce its uh, coloring. So shade to a set distance and then be it either in millimeters on the output or in map units. So I say, okay, I want each of these to be uh, five kilometers. So let's say five map units, the meter is the map unit. So in this case I've then reduced the area that I'm using so I've got a larger area with less density in it. So thinking about contrast I have ensured that I have a relatively sharp high contrast on the edge and I have reduced without having to have this um, using my color space too much. So. Shape Burst is a good tool, although it does make maps look a wee bit fun, but it can solve some problems. You'll also see, if you look at classical Atlas maps, you'll also see the use of the Shape Burst. Harmony tries to address the relationship between our different maps. Um, looking at if no map should be disproportional, large, or disproportionately heavy in its weight or colouring. So in our map here, if we looked at our um, scale of this one, if I made it much larger like that, just to show demonstrate where there's no harmony, I have changed this one is now disproportional large compared to our I also think that was a wee bit too large. So harmony is very much about ensuring that things don't stick out. I could also, if I had changed the font here, would be another way of breaking my harmony. Um, let's see, what do we have? I, want, uh, I have no value there. Um, make my font pink. And then again, it breaks the harmony because pinkness does not belong together with my otherwise grey and black douche colouring. So that's not a uh, good solution. I'll undo that and I will uh, resize my little thing here. By the way, note that it has not updated the map from before. If I press the update, it will do that. But uh, I'll try and reconstruct my map from before over here. So I'll get a bit of that one. I'll activate mask and I'll activate my background and I will zoom in on my little area in Flexbear. Like that. So I think that it will now, uh, I won't risk that it will 
distort this one too much. It has a scale lock on it. I entered this one to 50,000, so it, even though it's not exactly the same, it will probably stay more or less the same. Balance. Balance is how we use the paper. Um, in general, things normally balance about the center of mass. And we don't like our maps not to do that. We like our maps to center on the center of mass. Here, center of mass is generated by graphic elements. Then how heavy are things, how much black, how much heavy colors do we have around. And also, we want to think, send, use the have the important part of our map close to the center. Um, it, the strange thing is that the center is not the visual center of a map is not the same as the physical center. It's around five percent higher. So when we talked about this map reading line, what we go is if we go from the top corner and then to this optical center, and then from there we go down to our bottom corner. And, and therefore you will find that the classical map has marginalia at the bottom because then we can lift the data frame higher up so that the data frame would be at the center of our physical paper here. So if we look at this one you will see that I have here left more space beneath my frame than above the frame in order to lift my map up. We might say that, well, while this map line here constructed a bad breadcrumb, it was not good in that this map at the moment has a graphics that is out of balance. Um, we ha only have one graphical element here at the bottom in one side. Um, in order to redo that, I might consider our swapping those two or bringing this down here like this. So I've got some more graphics down here, but still that one's a wee bit too heavy up there. So I might consider taking this one down to somewhere like that, and then bringing this up to a line like that. Ah, oh, maybe it's should align with this ticked up instead. Like that. Mm -hmm. Difficult to say. We'll leave it there. Um, so now I have ensured that I've got two heavy graphical elements at the bottom of my map design, ensuring that this map won't fall over. Okay. So I put something heavy at the bottom and not at the top because that gives my map a good balance. I should also make sure that they are evenly distributed. I have a wee bit of the problem because the main part of my map is over in this corner. But there's a good reason for that that we'll come to in a short while. Um, so, implementing balance, um, moving things around. Um, ensure, basically, the first rule of creating a map is to ensure that the largest amount of space is allocated to the important part. So this one here, you start by allocating as much as possible to that. Maybe I could have allocated a wee bit more. Oh, then um, you, you use other things um, in the rule of couch. So you try not to break any of the rules. And um, you might need to insert extra graphics. Um, we could go out and find the a logo of the Expert Municipality and place it down here in order to get a wee bit more density down at the bottom of our map. So we can use odds and ends, um, might find a historical photograph or something like it to insert in order to create our balance. The last thing I'm going to mention is how do we practically make maps for project works. Most project reports are printed on A4 and um, we, you'll soon find out that we often want to have A3 for our maps because we need lots of space and um, therefore we often do this trick that we take an A3 paper and divide it down the center line so we have two halves 
be set aside a wee bit in the left side for margin and for stamp for gluing or however the project is going to be collected and then we take the other half here and fold again so we have approximately three thirds out we have this part here so if we now fold first along this fold and then fold that fold out we can put it into a report without getting this part glued in because that will be folded from there to there when it's folded when the reader then reads the map they can skim through and see the title and important elements out in the margin here on this part of the map as an A4 so they can see quickly what map to look at when they found the right map they can pull in the fold and they can unfold the map to its full size so this is our standard way of creating a, um, a map layout for an A4, A4 project. So it's the end of this short walkthrough of map design. Um, we will be working on increasing our using this but I have tried, decided to put this relatively early in the course so that you can practice on all the following exercises. So thank you for now. Bye.